Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. NASA made an incredible 10-year time-lapse of the sun's fiery rotation. Tim Hortons is facing a class-action lawsuit over app location tracking. Disney has been developing incredibly lifelike deep-fake technology. Japan's ARM-based Fugaku is now the world's fastest supercomputer. Apple-backed firm aims for one million robo-taxis. And Facebook has developed a new set of VR glasses that look like a chunky pair of sunglasses. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. You shouldn't stare at the sun, it's dangerous. But this month marks a full decade of NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory doing the staring at the sun for us. It's been studying the star closest to Earth nonstop from orbit, gathering 425 million high-resolution images since June 2010. The data collected has helped scientists make many discoveries. But for those of us scrolling the Internet for some kind of good news, NASA has turned the observations into something fun. NASA has compiled the images into a stunning time-lapse of the star's activity over the last 10 years. The time-lapse assembles images taken at an extreme ultraviolet wavelength that shows the sun's outermost atmospheric layer, the corona. The movie compiles a photo every hour with dark slides caused by the Earth or the moon eclipsing the observatory as they pass between the spacecraft and the sun. The full video lasts 61 minutes, showcasing the sun's 11-year solar cycle with its rise and fall in activity. The shift in solar activity can be clearly seen as the number of swelling solar spots increase to explosive levels with violent whips of magnetic field lines and solar flares. It then calms down again to a period known as solar minimum, when the amount of solar activity is relatively low. That's a period we're in now, with one result being that the northern lights are less frequently seen in lower latitudes. It's stunning to see from our perspective even if a decade is a little more than a blip in the life of a star. The full time-lapse video in 4K resolution can be viewed at cat5.tv slash sun. Tim Hortons is facing a class action lawsuit in Quebec over data collection issues in the company's mobile ordering app, filed a day after four privacy watchdogs announced a joint investigation into the company's overreach. The court application filed by two Montreal-based law firms on Tuesday cites an investigative story by the Financial Post which revealed the Tim Hortons app was logging users' location data in the background even when the app wasn't open. The app was streaming GPS location data to Radar Labs Inc., an American company which analyzes location data to infer where users live and work and logs a person's visits to one of Tim Hortons' competitors, such as Starbucks or McDonald's Corp. Immediately after privacy commissioners for the federal government, um, Quebec, Alberta and British Columbia announced their joint investigation on Monday. Tim Hortons said in a statement that it has discontinued its practice of tracking users' location when the app is not open. The lead plaintiff is a Montreal resident who works in the IT sector. And even though defined by his lawyer as a tech-savvy guy, he was shocked to find out how the app was tracking him. Consumer protection lawyer Joey Zucrin said that simply stopping the practice of background location tracking isn't enough, because Tim Horton's parent company appears to have been tracking the lead plaintiff since last year, and the damage is already done. Zucrin says they've gained a valuable database of information and behavior patterns and activities of individuals. So are they now just going to throw that out or are they going to profit from it? My guess, my guess is the latter. Tim Horton's Chief Corporate Officer Duncan Fulton, Fulton said in an emailed statement the company did not have any comment on the class action lawsuit and reiterated that it had discontinued background location tracking, although the app may still record user location when it's open. In many cases of privacy violations, it's difficult to sue because litigants can't put a dollar value on the harm they have suffered. But the Quebec Charter of Rights and Freedoms makes privacy a protected right, and that simplifies the case.
Most privacy and data cases in Canada have been focused on breaches where companies allowed private information to be leaked or stolen by hackers. But litigation around issues relating to data and privacy could become more common, depending on how the courts respond in this case and future cases. A new paper published by Disney Research describes a fully automated neural network-based method for swapping faces in photos and videos, the first method that results in high-resolution results of sufficient quality to be used in film and TV. The researchers specifically intend this tech for use in replacing an, an existing actor's performance with a substitute actor's face, for instance, when de-aging or increasing the age of someone, or potentially when portraying an actor who has passed away. They also suggest it could be used for replacing the faces of stunt doubles in cases where the conditions of a scene call for them to be used. This method is unique from other approaches in a number of ways, including that any face used in the set can be swapped with any recorded performance, making it possible to relatively easily re-image the actors on demand. The other is that it recreates contrast and lighting conditions to ensure the actor looks like they are actually present in the same conditions as the scene. You can check out the results for yourself in this video. As you can see, there's still a hint of uncanny valley going on here, but the researchers acknowledge that in their paper calling this a major step toward photorealistic face swapping that can successfully bridge the uncanny valley. It is still a lot more realistic than other attempts, which is especially apparent when you've seen the side-by-side -side comparisons with other techniques. Most notably, it works at much higher resolution, which is key for actual entertainment industry use. Considering the example of using this technique for a stunt double, the realis realism could come across as being incredibly realistic. The examples presented are a super small sample, so it remains to be seen how broadly this can be applied. The subjects used appear to be primarily white, for instance. Also, there's always the question of the ethical implication of any use of face swapping technology, especially in video, as it could be used to fabricate credible video or photographic evidence of something that didn't actually happen. Given, however, that the technology is now in development from multiple quarters, it's essentially long past the time for debate about the ethics of its development and exploration. Instead, it's welcome that organizations like Disney Research are following the academic path and sharing the results of their work so that others concerned about its potential malicious, malicious use can determine ways to flag, identify, and protect against any bad actors. Japan's ARM-based Fugaku is now the world's fastest supercomputer. An Apple-backed firm aims at one million robo-taxis, and Facebook has developed a new set of VR glasses that look like a chunky pair of sunglasses. Becca has these stories coming up, plus Robert's here with the Crypto Corner. Don't go anywhere. Welcome to the Crypto Corner, and again we've got a fully loaded program for you. So let's dive into it. If we look into the market, then you'll see that there has been a slight drop between last week and this week from 277 billion to 263 billion. Uh, an average around 5% drop between last week and this week. Uh, if we saw this here by seven days, then last week we had 20 coins that gained more than 15%. This time it's a mere six coins. And uh, on the downside, last week we had two coins that lost more than 15%. This time it's a few more than that. So it's slightly bearish behavior in the market. And if we look into the DeFi market, um, then similar picture there from 6.7 billion down to 6.1 billion uh, drop between last week and this week. Now, as you remember, last week we went into detail uh, in regards to the DeFi market, how to participate in this market uh, and how the future looks like but also that there are risks attached to that because it's a very young market. And so this is what happened between last week and this week. A hacker stole around half a million uh, US dollars. Now it's not stealing in the traditional sense where you just take something, it's just that they made use of these different protocols in a way that uh, they were able to harvest uh, around half a million US dollars. And the way that worked is, uh, as you remember, this is one of those platforms where you can participate. 
And so you, they used the uh, balancer pool, the balancer platform in one of those pools. And um, they used the flash loan technology. So with this technology, which means a flash loan is something that happens between two blocks. So it's never registered. So you can take a loan as high as you want. doesn't matter because it's never registered. But between two, those two blocks, you can do whatever you want to do. Uh, you can do whatever you want to with that money. And that's what they did. So they took out the, that loan and then they started swapping between the Ethereum and the SDA token. Uh, and they did that 24 times until the whole pool was uh, drained. Again, that's between two blocks. So it is never registered, but they were making use of that. And every time that this uh, transfer happened, a transfer fee of 1% was charged to the recipient, but that was not registered on the balancer platform. And so every time the attacker swapped uh, between those two coins, uh, those two tokens, the balancer pool received 1% less STA than uh, was expected. And these people were harvesting that. So uh, it shows how young this industry is, but also how interesting it is. And uh, um, as I encouraged you last week, just uh, go in there and learn more about it. Now, on the other side, looking at the traditional market, something similar happened. Uh, 2.8 billion US dollars were scammed in the gold market. Now, that's something that would never have, be able to happen in the Bitcoin uh, or the crypto market, especially Bitcoin, because it's the most secure platform in the world. Uh, but in gold, everybody who operates with certificates, so not the physical gold. It's a certificate that's being transferred. And that's where the scam happened. Uh, with Bitcoin, that would have never happened because Bitcoin was never hacked. Uh, so it's the most secure um, uh, software platform in the world. Now, um, something interesting is somebody published a report um, that is fantastic. I encourage you to take a look at it. And as usual, I put the link into the description. But this report is in depth and very scientific and fantastic. I love this report. So uh, these they go into every single aspect of, of the market. So adoption rate, uh, uh, tax evasion, uh, remittance, and that on a global basis. And uh, they also look into uh, how the value is going to perform uh, from Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, and XRP. Uh, over the next uh, five to 10 years, um, they predicted their price. I'm not going to mention that here because it's not what we do, but uh, take a look into what that report says. But the interesting thing is really what they are talking about. So online transactions, how they look there. As you can see, it's really in detail of what um, they are analyzing and it's worth uh, spending some time into reading this report. It's 64, no, 61 pages. Now, um, part of this is, of course, as you heard from us last uh, or uh, a few weeks ago, is that China is moving into um, the, the Chinese renminbi into uh, cryptocurrency. And Canada is, uh, like most other countries, are planning to do similar things. Uh, the interesting thing is that some experts in Canada are uh, hoping that the Bank of Canada will be, uh, create a more inclusive and accessible um, uh, digital Canadian dollar. So let's hope that that happens because that would be beneficial for everybody in the world. And the last one is uh, uh, Coinbase. Um, they have got a section where you can earn money by just learning something. So you go into coinbase.com and then slash earn. And then you've got here a section where you can just uh, by learning something, uh, earn money. And it's, I think, in total over $400. And they just started this one here, the compound course, uh, where you can earn nine compounds, uh, $9 worth in compound um, uh, by just taking the course. Now, you have to be fast because these things sell out pretty fast. But it's just another way on how you can make small money, but you can make some money. Anyway, um, that's it from me uh, this week. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And I'm looking forward to see you next week. So thank you very much for watching. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder that we're not providing financial advice, but just sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency market. Always remember that the cryptocurrency market is ever-changing and always volatile, so you should only spend what you can afford to lose. Now, back to Becca in the newsroom. Thank you, Robbie. According to a semi-annual ranking announced by the U.S. European Top 500 Project on Monday, Japan's latest supercomputer, Fugaku, is the world's fastest for computing speed. 
This is the first time that a Japanese supercomputer has taken the top position in nine years when the K computer, Fugaku's prede predecessor, took first place at this time in 2011. Jointly developed by Japan's state-backed Riken Center for Computational Science and Fujitsu, Fugaku is the first ever ARM-based system to become the world's fastest supercomputer. It scored a high-performance LINPAC HPL score of 415.5 petaflops, which makes it 2.8 times faster than IBM Summit's 148.6 petaflops, that is now in second place in the top 500 supercomputer rankings. Fugaku is powered by Fujitsu's 48-core ARM-based A64FX system on chip and consists of nearly 7.3 million CPU cores. In single precision operations, it reaches peak performance of over 1,000 petaflops, which pushes our vernacular into the next tier at 1 exaflop. The chips run at 2.0 GHz with a boost to 2.2 GHz and carry 32 GB of second-generation high-bandwidth memory each. This ARM-based supercomputer also secured the number one position in other rankings that test computers on different parameters, including Graph 500, HPL, AI, and high-performance conjugate gradient. This is the first time that a supercomputer has simultaneously topped the rankings in the above four categories, according to Fujitsu. Currently installed at the Riken Center for Computational Science, in Kobe, Japan, Fugaku is, will also carry out a wide range of applications that will address high-priority social and scientific issues. While the supercomputer is expected to start full-time operation in April next year, they are already using it in the fight against COVID-19. In recent years, countries like the U.S. and China have dominated the race to develop powerful machines. This time, too, China dominated the top 500 list with 226 supercomputers, while the U.S. took second place with 114 systems, followed by Japan with 30, France with 18, and Germany with 16 systems. Chinese ride-hailing firm Didi Chuqing says it plans to operate more than a million self-driving vehicles by 2030. According to Didi's chief operating officer, Meng Xing, the robo-taxis are to be deployed in places where ride-hailing drivers are less available. The company last month completed a more than $500 million fundraising round for the autonomous driving unit led by SoftBank Group's Vision Fund 2. Apple, who is known to be interested in the development of autonomous driving, invested $1 billion into DD back in 2016. Last year, Didi said it would start using autonomous vehicles to pick up passengers in Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen this year before expanding the scheme outside China in 2021. Automakers and tech companies in China are investing heavily in the autonomous driving industry to compete with the likes of Tesla, Alphabet, Waymo, and Uber. While some industry insiders say it will take time for the public to trust autonomous vehicles fully, Meng said Didi expects autonomous vehicles to be in mass production by 2025. Competitors are already offering robo-taxi service, but a fleet of one million vehicles would put them all to shame. We'll keep our eye on this and see if Didi is able to deliver. Facebook has created a virtual reality headset that's not much larger than a chunky pair of sunglasses. The futuristic shades use a specially designed holographic film to miniaturize the lens. Conventional VR displays tend to be bulky as the refractive lenses inside of them need a couple of inches to focus the display for its wearer's eyes. The result is a pair of glasses that are most, at most only 9 millimeters thick, according to the researchers, and weigh only 17.8 grams. Images from the glasses' green and black display are frankly extremely cyberpunk. The glasses can provide an approximately 90-degree horizontal field of view, according to testing detailed in a paper published by Facebook Research. The design also does away with the traditional LCD panels used in conventional VR headsets and uses lasers instead to create an image. That means pixel counting isn't really an option. It's still an early prototype with plenty of limitations. Since light rays from the backlight fan out significantly before they are focused by the holographic beam splitter surface, large reason, regions of the display do not contribute to the display's field of view, the researchers write in the paper. 
The glasses are also still not capable of producing a full color image and exhibit ghosting around the edges of the field of view caused by optical surfaces reflecting light. The team already has a plan to reduce weight even further. By switching to plastic substrates, the researchers expect to bring total weight to just 6.6 .6 grams, about the weight of a pair of large aviator-style sunglasses. This news comes at the same time as Google's acquisition of Canadian smart glasses startup North, who developed lightweight focal smart glasses designed with a holographic display that only the user can see. It would appear augmented reality is still in the sights of these two big players, which could mean some interesting tech in the coming years. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category 5.TV Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson.